Casual Diary Podcast, episode 323. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because what we are going to talk about is something, well, I think all of us are faced with in various different times. I mean, you want to start your business, but hey, do I you know, pull the money out of my own pocket and bootstrap this thing and, and let the customer fund it? Or do I raise capital? Or you know, what, what type of business for that matter? At the end of the day, What it comes down to is, are you big enough, brave enough to go out there and make your idea or ideas happen? Well, I have with me today a person who's done exactly that. And we're going to dig into not only his background, how he got started, but most importantly, what keeps him going? Because it takes energy to make things happen. Now, what's really cool is that he works in a space that you may not think of as, oh, cool, I'll start a business just in this space to be able to help other people in terms of customer service, because guess what? Technology changes nearly everything all the time. So customer service has evolved. He has evolved. He found his business to be able to help in that way. And we're going to talk to him because, well, one, he's got a cool accent. And two, he's got information to share. So help me welcome none other than Joshua March. Josh, you there? I am indeed. Great to be on here. Thanks for being here. I'm glad that you're here. So being the first time here, I tend to ask everybody the same question the very first time that they're here. Are you ready, sir? I am always ready. I like that answer. All right. So I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So you could go Supergirl, Batman, Robin, You get the idea. Um, And entrepreneurs and superheroes have a lot in common. Chief among them, in my opinion, is that occasionally we get dressed up, uh, but we, you know, we put on our own invisible cape, (laughs) sometimes a mask, those types of things. And we use our ideas uh, and develop a product or service and go around and save our customers. That's at least how I see it in my mind. Now, I also think that entrepreneurs are like superheroes in that we, we have a beginning. We have an origin story. For example, before, you know, Wonder Woman was out there being Wonder Woman, you know, she was at home in the Amazon doing her thing. <laughs> and at the end of the day, all of us have an origin story. So what we want to know is before founding multiple companies, before starting, I mean, what I think is really cool is you started in England and now are over here in the U.S. with a new company. Before Div, uh, d- digging, I should say, into customer service before VCs and all that other stuff were in your life. We want to know who is Joshua March. Uh, well, I think my superhero would be Wolverine, if that helps. Um, <laughs> nice. He was, he was he was always my favorite. Um, I, so I actually wanted to be a lawyer. That was my in, in the kind of early days when I was growing up. That was my uh, initial kind of dream. Okay, and okay, I, and on, I went on, to college on. to do. Did you say lawyer? I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah to be a lawyer. Now, okay. now, in particular, in England, there are different types of lawyers, and there are some lawyers who are kind of your standard commercial lawyers called solicitors, and there are some called barristers who uh, are, are self employed and uh, the ones who are in court making arguments. And I always wanted to be a barrister. I liked the idea. I always liked the idea of being self employed and kind of arguing and making my point and not being hired by anyone. So that, that was always kind of the dream. Okay. Got it. Um, so, so I went to college uh, to actually do an undergraduate law degree, which you can do in England. I don't think you can uh, you can do that in America. And um, you know, was studying away, and actually got a job in my in my first summer holiday um, that was kind of working at this firm, doing legal related work 
uh, but that was that was kind of a, kind of a startup where they were helping bars and restaurants change their licensing laws. England had just introduced their 24 hour licensing. So bars could stay open all night for the first time. And every single bar and restaurant in the country had to change their licensing laws as a result. Uh, and I was getting involved in this and helping out. And I realized really, really quickly that uh, you didn't actually have to be a qualified lawyer to offer this as a service. Um, hmm. and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like this works actually pretty easy. I now kind of figured out how to do it. Why are these like old dudes charging loads of money and I'm the one doing all the work and yeah, <laughs> and getting paid like hardly anything. So I was like, all right. So I just, I quit the job, printed some business cards and just went around saying that I could do it and ended up setting up this kind of first business that was hmm. just over a few months during the summer holidays of college. Um, helping out bars, changing their, changing their licensing laws. And, and it was that experience which kind of made me go, you know what, the, the business side of this, what I've just done was actually much more interesting than, uh, than the legal side. Uh, and I was like, you know what, I want to be an entrepreneur. And uh, it was from that moment that I kind of, you know, my heart was set on being an entrepreneur and I was uh, yeah, embarking on the journey. Interesting, interesting. What I like about what you just shared is uh, – you didn't wait for anybody's permission. <laughs> You're just like, well, hold on, wait a minute. These old dudes. Now, how old were they really? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I was like 19, I guess, at the time. So uh, I thought of them as old. They were probably like 30. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I think they were like some middle-aged lawyers. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that would exactly. That's what I was thinking of. Like, how old were they? How old could they have possibly have been? But yes, I get it. The idea. You didn't wait for anybody's permission. You just saw. You saw an opportunity. And said, well, I can do it. Now, that, that says a number of things about you. For example, uh, a lot of people see opportunity, but very few have the courage to go out there and go, well, I'll do it. Where do you think that comes from for you? Uh, you know, I, I think that one thing for me is that I, I, I don't really have a significant fear of failure. Um, hmm. I always have viewed failure as just a, a learning experience. And if I'm not good at something, then I get excited about the opportunity to, to learn and improve. Um, and I actually think that the kind of background story for that uh, is slightly romantic. Okay. okay. Uh, I was uh, madly, in lo- I fell madly in love with a girl in high school when I was 12 years old and it was completely unrequited. She didn't love me back at all. Um, and I was like passionately in love with her, but like completely failed at getting her for like the entirety of my teenage years. Um, and it was like immensely emotionally painful. Um, but I also then learned to just be like happy and charming and not worried about it, even though I was like failing every day. Uh, and I actually think that that's kind of changed my perception of failure in general and, and turned failure into something that, that I, it's just like, well, that's fine. You know, I, I lived with like the worst emotionally heart-wrenching <laughs> failure every day for the entirety of my teenage years. So like, what does it matter if I like don't succeed at starting this business? You do realize you just gave given every female the opportunity to now say, you know, I'm just training you for your future job. That's really what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, it could work. It could. I guess. I guess. Okay. Well, that's an interesting training ground. That is by far the most unique. Now, when you say that uh, you you just decided to you printed up some business cards and started offering that. Was that like, I mean, I'm assuming that was the best marketing strategy available to you. I mean, sometimes people let that stop them. They're like, well, how do I get in front of people? How do I talk? Had you had some prior sales experience? Anything? You just like, I can do it and let me just go walk the pavement. I mean, what did that really how it went down? I mean, pretty much. I mean, to give it a little bit more color, it was this relatively unique time when the, when the, the laws changed and all of the bars and restaurants in England had three months over the summer where they had to change their licenses over. So everyone like had to do it and no one really knew how to do it. And so there was this like very big window of opportunity. Um, and I you know, spent a couple of weeks learning how to actually do the, the, you know, the actual practice of doing it. And I've always been kind of, you know, I guess kind of confident and charming. So I was like, I'll just go and do it. And actually when I first went out, I, I think I just printed some flyers and started giving them out to people, you know, going and leaving them through the through the letter boxes of all these different bars and restaurants, and also just walking in and talking to the owners. Um, and then uh, there was actually an occasion where someone asked me for a business card, and I was like, "Oh, I actually just ran out, but I'll, I'll give you one you know, next time I come in tomorrow." And then I was like, "Okay, I better get some business cards printed." And so I just kind of printed something off at the local local copier shop. Totally love it because 
So many people spend time waiting to get ready. Well, uh, before I can go out and talk to people, I got to have all of these pieces to get together. You sound like you're uh, you're kind of a, a fire, then get ready, then aim and fire again kind of guy. Um, yeah, well, I, I think I'm definitely way more sophisticated today than I was than I was then, right, over, over 10 years ago. Uh, and, and I think certainly today I've really learned the value of preparation um, I think, yeah, you know, my natural inclination is often to kind of, you know, just move quickly, break things, learn quickly from it and try again. And I think that there is, there is a ton of value in that and, and being rapid and iterating quickly. Um, but I've also learned the huge value in being prepared and actually, you know, so few people in business really do prepare that I think, you know, before you go to meetings, you really spend the time understanding, you know, what you're trying to do, what your objectives are, who you're going in, it can make a, a massive difference. Um, but that's a whole other, a whole other topic. Indeed, indeed. Now, take us from that, you know, in endeavor, <laughs> empire to where you are today. What was that path? What did that look like? Sure. Uh, well, there's a number of steps and missteps. So yeah, sure. that was a kind of great, great experience. Uh, I, I was still at, at college doing an undergraduate law degree, um, but I kind of decided that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and basically stopped going to lectures. I did the kind of minimum amount of work needed that I could still graduate just because I didn't want to upset my mum too much. Got it. Um, but it yeah, started coming up with other business ideas and I had an idea for an e-commerce company um, uh, that the, the kind of basic idea at the time was that there was a lot of growing interest in kind of fair trade, eco, all of these kind of things. But that uh, when you looked at the products that were available on, on the market, uh, they were many of them were like pretty shoddy, not very high quality, not very design led, uh, often being sold by people who, uh, who you know, were kind of like hippies saying they buy these because they're fair trade, not because of they, they're actually good products. Uh, and so my idea was like, well, I'll just find the most high quality design led products that are also eco, that are also fair trade and like package them up really nicely and like sell them online to, to the yuppie market. Um, was the kind of the core of the business plan, um, which actually I think was a reasonably good idea. But, you know, I was a 20 year old full time law student with no real business experience other than this kind of licensing thing I'd done over the summer. Um, but nevertheless, I, I bought business plan for dummies. Um, <laughs> yes. And when wrote, I think it was like a 67 page business plan. Wow. Uh, when I then was like started networking and going to different business events and met a, a bank manager um from one of the big banks and like pitched my idea and uh she said come into the office and talk to us about it so i spoke to them about it and two weeks later they gave me a bank loan for 100 grand what? Uh, pounds at that time it was about one hundred fifty thousand dollars at the time um this was obviously pre-financial crisis just before pre-financial crisis so they were kind of throwing money around like crazy mm. uh, but yeah to be in context this was i was a 20 year old full-time law student with no real business experience with a business plan that i wrote with business plan for dummies and they walked they just they gave lent me the money with no personal guarantee um which w was kind of crazy and, and didn't turn out that well for them unfortunately uh but i, I went and you know, set up this business and you know, hired staff and designed a website and bought materials, um, but you know, just didn't really have a good understanding of how to actually do all, operate all that. So I made just a, a ton of mistakes, um, and I you know, learned from a lot of those mistakes. You know, I'd got the website you know, built by a fancy agency, and I ended up you know, redoing it myself with a friend. Um, I, uh, you know, had to redo all the stock at one point, I had to you know, learn how to do online marketing, all these kind of lessons that I had to, had to learn. Um, and, you know, eventually I did create a business that, w that was making money. Um, but at that point I'd kind of burnt through all of the bank loan and was starting to have to pay it back, um, and realize that I would really need to raise a lot more money if I was going to build a kind of design led business. I needed a whole wide, much wider range of products. I needed to be able to market them much more aggressively. Um, and although I'd learned a lot of lessons about how to run the business, I, you know, it was kind of financial crisis was hitting. I didn't understand the VC uh, market or how to raise money. Uh, and so I had to shut the business down uh, just as I was graduating. Oh, wow. And you were still going to school at the same time. Okay. That's impressive. Uh, so the yeah, I wasn't getting I wasn't getting a lot of sleep at the time. <laughs> no, <laughs> I can't imagine that you were, and that I'm like, wow. So all of that and still going to school at the same time. So you you mentioned a ton of mistakes. Uh, I 
talk to us a little bit about those mistakes, meaning how valuable have they been, you know, those mistakes now in your future endeavors? I mean, I, I think there are a couple of kind of key lessons. You okay. know, one was just kind of personal arrogance, right? I was like this like super overconfident, you know, arrogant young guy. I was like, oh, I'm just going to start this business and become a billionaire overnight. Um, and wait, 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 so, wait, wait, that didn't happen? Oh, man. Uh, unfortunately not. I know, it's crazy, <laughs> right? <laughs> what, what went wrong? Um, so I think the biggest one was learning, you know, hey, your business is difficult. Uh, it's hard. There are lots of things that I don't know. Um, and you know, th this isn't going to just be some kind of easy walk in the park. So that was a major one, uh, you know, learning to be, be much more humble. Um, and the other one that I think was very related was that while I was doing this business, uh, I actually went and spoke to lots of very successful entrepreneurs and talked about what I was doing and got advice and spoke to like e-commerce people and I did all, all these kind of things. And uh, I, you know, they, they told me lots of things and gave me lots of recommendations and I wrote lots of notes. But when I was kind of looking back and, and reflecting, I was like, you know what? I got told, these people had told me all the mistakes that I was making, but I just didn't actually listen. I didn't really pay attention. I always kind of thought that I knew better. Mm. Um, and so that was a really valuable lesson, like learning uh, some of the value in experience uh, and the value in learning from other people. And I think that's really, really hard as an, as an entrepreneur, right? Because on the, on the one hand, you've always got to be able to make your own decisions and you can go and speak to two like equally experienced people and, and they may give you conflicting advice that, that can happen all the time. So there's never, there's never really like a right answer or, or a wrong answer. Um, but you've got to be prepared to listen and, and to reflect and realize that whatever you're thinking first isn't necessarily the right answer. And that, that was a really important lesson. I can imagine. I can imagine. Now, so you 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 go from this company then to what what was next? So uh, that experience got me really really interested in online marketing. Got it. And I was like, yeah, uh, I, I just like obviously really messed up. I didn't understand how to fully market myself, so I started really just kind of getting into that, reading every book I could, reading all the blogs I could, and, and that got me really excited about the whole social media space. Um, yeah, this was kind of 2007. You know, Facebook could was kind of getting big. MySpace was still around. There was Bebo in the UK. Uh, Facebook had just launched its its application platform, which allowed third parties to build applications on top of it. And so it was like this whole new opportunity for brands to start getting engaged. And I got really, really excited by that whole space. I was like, this is completely new. I think this can can really change how brands like engaging and interacting and marketing with, with their customers. Um, and so I just started learning everything I could about it. Um, and I got kind of really excited about it. I actually started getting involved with events, with some of the early events of people building it. Uh, I actually started learning to program as well. So I got really interested in that. Um, and I pretty quickly decided that you know, I didn't know exactly what the idea was, but there was a big opportunity to like help companies uh, get involved in this. And so I actually started just cold calling uh, big businesses in London. And I was like, hey, uh, you guys need to be doing stuff on Facebook. Like I can help. Like, you know, hire me. And I'll like, you know, build your applications, I'll do consulting, like whatever it is. Um, and so I just started like, you know, again, slightly being the kind of you know, cocky 21 year old at this time, but <laughs> uh, legitimately having spent a lot of time, you know, learning everything about these new platforms, starting to build a network of engineers who are building apps for these platforms um, and just started cold calling these big companies. And of course, these big companies, everyone was like really excited about Facebook and really excited about all these new platforms, but didn't know anyone that knew anything about them. And so they took my call and were like excited to, like, to get me to come in and speak to them. And so I started to do um, you know, bits of consultancy, uh, building some applications for different businesses, Facebook applications, so I to make a bit of money. Now, a little bit of context uh, just to, to add to this, that when I said I had to kind of shut the business down at the end of college, you know, I still had this bank loan uh, that was like, you know, $150,000 that obviously right. I, couldn't re I couldn't repay. Um, and I was actually extremely lucky that uh, the financial crisis was happening and there was so much kind of crap going on for the banks that you know the hundred fifty thousand dollars was was really just kind of uh, you know it was nothing to them. They just wanted me to go away. I was like more hassle than it was worth. And so um, I remember this time kind of going in and seeing this kind of haggard, tired bank bank manager, 
uh, with like piles of paperwork on his desk and like hundreds of millions of dollars of losses stacking up. And he said, look, we, you know, we just want you to go away. And he's like, look, if you fire sale everything, put as much money as you can in the bank, close the accounts, we'll give you a letter that says we're not going to you know, worry about the loan and just like you know, shut the company down and leave us alone. What? Um, yeah, so I was, I was extremely lucky. But so, so because of that, uh, I was like, well, I've, I've just been given a massive reprieve. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, there's no way I can make this company go bankrupt. I can, I can keep that off. But to do that, there were other smaller vendors who I would have to pay off fully. Um, and so I probably ended up with about, I think it was like thirty or forty thousand uh, dollars in debt, per, personal well, debt for the company, but that I wanted to take on personally and ensure I could pay off completely, so that I could then just cut, shut the company down cleanly and avoid it going bankrupt. Because I thought, you know, I had such a great opportunity because of that, uh, because of that with the bank, that it would be silly of me to still go bankrupt for for a smaller amount. Um, right. And so uh, when I got to London, uh, I didn't grow up in London. I grew up a few hours outside in the country. But my my uncle, uh, who a very very kind gentleman, had said, "You know, you can come and stay with me for a few months while you get your feet back on the ground." Um, and so I moved in with him, and he housed and fed me. Uh, and it actually took eighteen months before I was earning enough money to uh, to get out and get my own apartment. So I was extremely lucky that um, my uncle nice. kind of took me in and looked after me through that time um but but essentially that that consultancy and those applications you know, these things i was doing evolved into a proper company um which was called iplatform that became one of the uh, first proper facebook app development agencies so we were building uh, competitions and promotions different kind of interactive marketing campaigns on facebook for for many big brands um, in love with clients like mcdonald's and swatch and uh, BBC and all this kind of stuff, and we became extremely close partners for Facebook. Um, you know, because they were very Facebook was smaller at the time, there were, uh, aren't, weren't many companies in the space, and we we actually became their only like officially recognised partner for building these things in the UK for for a couple of years, uh, wow. which was great because it meant in like 2008, 2009, uh, the big brand went to Facebook in the UK and were like, we want to do this big campaign, who can build it for us? Uh, they were recommending all these brands to come to us. Um, and throughout that time, I'd actually got kind of more and more interested in technology. I said I'd been learning to program and, and I started becoming really interested in how we could build um, a software business where we're selling the software rather than an agency where we're selling our time. And what we were doing at the time was really selling our time. You know, we, we, had, we had a team of engineers and designers who were expertise, experts in, in Facebook, and we were selling our time to build different applications for different clients. But what I really wanted to do was kind of build um, a, a software that we could just resell, which obviously is much, much more valuable long term. Um, but we kind of the first a few ideas kind of didn't quite work and we just ended up building this successful agency. Um, which, which, although it was great, it was kind of profit making. Uh, I you know, completely no investors. I had w- one business partner, and we were fifty fifty, and I was able to you know, pay off all my debt. You know, have a nice apartment in London, all, all that kind of stuff, which was great. Um, but when I kind of looked to the future, I was like, you know, I, I really want to build something big uh, and something that's going to be like sustainably valuable. Uh, I don't want to do something where we have to keep selling every single deal, and although each deal is very profitable. You know, none of them have any kind of recurring value, uh, and that's why that's what kind of got me interested in uh, doing my next business or what I'm doing now, Converse Social, which is obviously a kind of uh, software as a service business where you know, we invest into the technology uh, and then we license it to our clients, and so it's you know high margin and recurring revenues, uh, which is great, great once it gets going. Um, and so the kind of journey journey on that, which I can talk more on in terms of how we started. But uh, essentially, we kind of started this new team within iPlatform to start working on Converse Social. Uh, and when we realized it was like definitely going to be a real business and, and had a lot of opportunity, <laughs> we decided to go and you know, raise investments. We raised VC round and we separated out the companies and sold sold iPlatform to another agency. Got it. Got it. OK. See, what I what I like about, you know, this is what I'm hearing is it was the word you said it involved into a proper company. And I'm like, this wasn't it, your idea for Converse Social wasn't exactly clear. Uh, you couldn't see that from where you were at the time, but it's what what you've eventually iterated down to. Here's the value. Here's uh, the the recurring you know uh, revenue. Here's how I want to go out there and build something big. 
Uh, I really like the fact that you were willing to go out there and start something, um, but and, and just get to the point to where, oh, okay, cool. Now this is this is the thing. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that process looked like for you? Because this is I, I can I can hear the evolutionary process, but what it, what was it like going through it? You know, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. Where you start isn't necessarily where you stay. And that's completely okay. The point is, is that you can hear in everybody's story, every entrepreneur that we have ever talked to, they started somewhere, but they may not have stayed where they started, but they grew. And that was the most important thing is learning from the lessons. You're going to be no different. That's why we're saying this. I'll say it again. You are going to be no different. Unless, of course, you choose not to take any risks whatsoever, and then you're going to continue down the path that you are already on. My guess is you're listening because you're hoping to find a better way. Well, that better way is on the other side of all of those fears and trepidation. And, well, here's a resource that can help you with that. Get a copy of my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy. Just go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Again, cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. One more time, cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Because you'll be able to understand a little bit more about my own journey and probably gain a number of tips that can help you on yours. Now, let's get back to the rest of the interview. Sure. Well, I'm a big fan of the, um, I think it's the Muhammad Ali quotes, right? Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Right. And I think that, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it, the same is definitely true of business, right? You can, you can lay all the best plans in the world, but especially if you're doing something new, um, you know, you can come up with all these ideas about how this completely new thing is, everyone's going to love it and everyone's going to buy it, but you just don't really have any idea until you get out there and get in front of real clients. Uh, and so I'm, I'm a big fan of, of having a kind of iterative and evolutionary approach to that. You know, that being said, um, you know, we had, to, had a clear vision from day one and that clear vision was like you know all communication is moving into social media it's moving into smartphones mobile messaging and that's that's a trend that's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and i think that's just going to be this huge opportunity to build software that will help companies communicate to their customers through these channels and that was the kind of founding vision and and in many ways that's the exact same vision that we have today but what changed is okay well, well that's a great vision but what does that mean in practice you know, if we're going out and building a software product, are we targeting small businesses? Are we targeting big businesses? Are we targeting targeting consumer businesses or uh, you know B two B businesses? Are we focusing on customer service, on sales, on marketing? You know, there's all these kind of other options with lots of complexity in in, in like you know the differences in how you would build those businesses. Um, and, and so the kind of evolutionary approach was really in figuring out all those answers. You know, we said we've got this. We said we've got this vision, mm-hmm. but how do we how do we figure out all of the uh, kind of derivative implications of that vision in terms of what we actually have to do? And that was really bit by bit. Got it. Got it. Makes perfect sense. Now, as you're going through this process, how do you land on the business model, uh, a SaaS business model, and go, oh, okay, yeah, that's th- th- this is what I, what we want to do like how how did that come to the top to say that that's the business model for us yeah i mean i i had that always going into it even even before you know, that particular vision i had this kind of you know dream of wanting to build a SaaS business model um and there's a lot of reasons for that partly it's just because it's immensely valuable revenue, right? If you can if you can invest and build a really cool piece of technology that you can then license out, um, then y- you can sell it at kind of ninety percent gross margin, and and because people keep buying it every year, it's a recurring revenue. Uh, then when you sign a client, that client can become immensely valuable. Uh, the kind of business model in in SaaS is that you, know, you have to constantly invest heavily into the product, um, which can take a lot up front, and you also have to invest heavily into acquiring new customers um you know especially if it's a kind of big enterprise sales model like we have you know, we have a pretty white glove approach we spend a lot of money to, on marketing on branding we have you know we have really accomplished uh, and smart sales reps who will spend a lot of time with the client ensuring it's the right fit and and you know melding what our solution to, to their business needs um but 
so we will rarely make kind of money off a customer in our first year, but then they'll stay our customer for many, many years and, and will become extremely valuable to us over time. Um, and, and so I saw a huge amount of opportunity in you know, building a kind of software as a service product, being able to scale up a company very, very quickly. Um, you know, with, with SaaS, if you get the model right, then you, know, you, you can scale it much, much faster than you can scale a services business. Because you know, whereas a services business, if it's an agency where you're kind of selling time, you, know, you can only grow as fast as you have people to sell. You know, if you're just selling licenses to software, you know, we can easily sell you know, a thousand seats tomorrow, or we could send, sell like ten thousand seats tomorrow. And you know, there'll be some extra time and everything we've got to put into it, um, but it's not linear, and so it can scale much more easily. Indeed, indeed. Now, what uh, obviously many people uh, understand the the concept of cash flow, etc. And I look at, you know, it's like instead of having a, a single family house, each customer <laughs> is the same unit of cash flow. But for the sake of those listening, um, what is Converse Social? Can you explain that to us so that we can have an understanding? And then who are the types of clients that you guys typically serve right now? Sure. So we're a, a customer engagement platform um, that really helps companies do large scale customer service through like social and mobile channels so to put that in a, l- a little bit less jargon uh, let's let's say you've rented a car from hertz right and you're having and something goes wrong with the car and, and you're having trouble. oh that would never happen and, 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 that would never happen no it obviously would never happen but you tweet at them and you're like hey i'm having this like big issue with my car well what's going to happen is that probably within minutes that uh, hertz is going to respond to you and actually help you out over twitter and we'll, fi- and, we'll, and we'll like fix your issue, you know, book you another car, whatever's needed. Um, and then you'll be like tweeting like, oh my God, Hertz are amazing. Uh, well, behind the scenes in Hertz's con- uh, call centers, they have a whole team of customer service agents whose job it is, is to come in, log in and log in to Converse Social in the morning. And Converse Social is providing them with the workflow, the analytics, the tools that they need to find those tweets that people are complaining over social media channels, respond to them and fix their issues. Well, hold on. That means I don't have to sit on hold anymore. Exactly. Yeah, we'd love to kill. We'd love to kill the phone call. <laughs> yeah, right. and because the kind of point of this um, is really about making it easy for customers to get help. Right. Uh, so many customer service experiences are just so frustrating. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we're living. We're living in this world today where on your smartphone you can like order taxis, order food, you can do Excel, you can like edit videos, you can probably edit podcasts. Maybe you have, um, but then like you have a customer service issue and you have to like sit on hold for forty five minutes. And it's like painful, <laughs> and you're going to drive yards, and you're like, "What? Well, that's a crazy thing." And, and actually, it's because uh, the kind of model, the kind of traditional model of customer service has been. Well, like customer service is just like really expensive. We should like try and save costs by making it harder for people to get help. Um, and they try and you know, put through, you have to jump through all these kind of hoops to finally speak to someone and finally get the help you need. Um, the actual impact of that, though, and there's just more and more data coming out that backs this up, is that if customers have a frustrating service experience, it has a hugely negative impact on their on their loyalty and customer loyalty. Um, you know, what customers want if something goes wrong is they just want to get their issue fixed, super super fast, super easy, super convenient. And if you do that well, then it actually has a really positive impact on you know, scores like net promoter score and customer retention. And so there's just a huge amount of business value if you can make customer service kind of effortless, right? And the great thing about social media is that it's just so easy. It's so convenient, right? Someone has an issue, they have a question, they can just tweet at you, they just like message you on Messenger. You know, it's on their phones, they already have it there. Um, you know, it's super fast and simple. They don't have to like wade through pages of a website and press email address and then like, wait two days to get a response and like they, they, yeah, all this kind of all this kind of crap that goes on. I know uh, nothing so about what you're value. talking about. Yeah. Never, never, <laughs> never. Uh uh-uh. uh. That's amazing. Yeah, so, Go ahead. So, so really, what we're aiming to do is just kind of make customer service like super effortless for these big brands, and, and we use like Hertz is a big customer, uh, Sprint is a big customer, Google is a customer. So we have about like, 250 big clients around the world, uh, big telcos, uh, you know, tra- airlines, travel companies, uh, big retailers in Europe as well. That's the kind of general customers we have. I think it's absolutely funny that a phone company is a customer. So 
<laughs> it's ironic, at least, simply because you don't want to sit on hold on the phone for the phone company. But it, it, yeah. <laughs> that's actually kind of funny. So that's cool. That's cool. That's excellent. Now, here here's a question. Ten years ago, did you see Converse Social as it is today? Definitely not. I mean, 10 years ago when I was, I was just getting into the whole like social media space and I was excited about like Facebook and applications and all this kind of stuff. And I think commerce social was definitely a kind of far away. I, I'd say it, it kind of evolved over the next, the, the next five years of time. My kind of thinking evolved significantly about how to build businesses that I wanted to do, be, a, be in SaaS, um, that I wanted to do something focused on communication, that I learned that I wanted to do something for big businesses as opposed to small businesses. There was a kind of definitely a big evolutionary thought process. And during that time, I also learned a lot about the world of tech startups and VCs and investments and all of that, which kind of you know, allowed me to, to go down that route with Conversocial when I was ready. Got it. So let's talk about that. The first one was just like, you know, hey, we'll 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 have the customers. Fun- well, actually, no. The first one was the bank loan. That thing, you know, did what it did. But then it became, all right. So this time, let's try to do it with you know customers and bootstrap it. And then you you have this idea for Converse Social, but you're like, you know what? This time, I'm going to try, uh, you know, some venture capital. So I, I find it interesting that you've tried three different forms of financing. Yeah. Um, so of the three, which do you prefer and why? You know, they're all very different, and I think the appropriate thing, or the right thing to do, is to pick the one that's appropriate to, to your business and the opportunity, right? So I think if you can bootstrap an opportunity, which we did with iPlatform, you know, it's pretty wonderful, right? You're in complete control. Uh, you know, you make profit. You can you know, take that profit out as dividends. Um, you know, have a nice time, and you can kind of just do your thing. And, and it's certainly the kind of least stressful of, of the of, of the three, I would say. Um, yeah, bank loans. I think uh, it depends on the business you're doing. I think if you're starting a completely new venture, especially in something like tech or anything, I would just say avoid them. You know, that they great. If, I'm sure they're great with property, and I'm sure and you know, they are great and become valuable even in SaaS businesses once you reach a certain stage. But at the beginning of a venture, you know, just not not the not the appropriate form. Um, Venture is a really interesting one and, and kind of raising external investments in general, um, because as soon as you do that, uh, the expectations change dramatically, right? Uh, although you're still technically CEO and technically an entrepreneur, you now have a board uh, with people on that board who, who have certain amounts of control. Uh, you know, I, I remember the first time I got a term sheet from a VC and it had this like long list of, of the kind of rights that they would get once they invested and I was kind of shocked. I almost like ripped it up <laughs> there and then and I was like, what, I, you know, how can I ever give this amount of kind of control away? Um, it turns out to be much more nuanced than that in practice. Um, but you know, with VCs, you're kind of dancing with the devil, right? It, it raising that investment allows you to build a business of a scale and, and, and a speed, which may just be impossible, uh, with bootstrapping. And, you know, certainly in the technology world, there, you know, there are certain types of businesses where you just have to move quickly. You have to invest ahead of the curve. You know, you have to be able to invest in R and D a certain amount before you can start selling, or you know that there's going to be competitors coming in, and that you have to outsell them and outmarket them and all this kind of stuff. And so, there are some businesses which you just have to be able to invest a lot into them, and you have to go and raise that money. And raising that money will allow you to build a business that would just be impossible otherwise. Um, but, you know, the, the the upshot of that or the downside of that is that you now have, you now have a board, you now have people looking over your shoulder. Um, you know, it can be, it can be stressful at times. No, um, you know, no stress. Yeah. <laughs> no. Zero stress, zero stress. Sleep perfectly every night. Um, but, but, you know, there is some value in that as well, right? It can teach you, can teach you a lot of discipline. Certainly in my case, you know, you, you bring on, uh, you know, these more experienced, uh, you know, smart people who've been around, you know, seen other businesses, seen other things. They expect, uh, you know, getting that kind of monthly reporting into the board and uh, on your performance and what's happening. You know, teaches you discipline and teaches you to be uh, to focus more on performance in the business as a whole. So I think there are lots of business benefits that come from it, but it can certainly be hard, especially if you've been a kind of born and bred entrepreneur or never had a job before. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So with with that being said, though, uh, I'm. I'm going to assume that 
you know, you would, even though the, the board is there, and to some it can sound like, oh, I just gave away, you know, control, and I get the idea of, you know, tearing up the term sheet and just moving on. I, I'm going to venture to say that the that the amount of wisdom that you gain by working with them as opposed to seeing them as the enemy is almost immeasurable and valuable. Would you agree? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, uh, generally, uh, VCs, uh, who are kind of professional investors sometimes they have operating experience sometimes sometimes they don't um they'll always be able to bring something to the table um but in the end you know they're not in there they're not running the business with you they don't have all of the details so they can really help with you know, a lot of general business advice a lot of general like pattern recognition of seeing this type of thing before and these are the kinds of things that you, you should watch out for um they can also help a lot with with contacts uh with their height if you need to hire like senior execs um you know various other things they might have con- their senior business uh, contacts at clients things like that there's lots of value they can bring but they're not necessarily going to be able to give you like detailed operational insight into how to do things better in your business got it got it got it okay that that, that totally makes sense so um, I know that we, we've talked a while now, and I'm sure people have gathered that you've got a vast amount of experience, uh, you, again, using multiple different, you've been in multiple different industries, you've done the I, I've got no <laughs> business cards thing, uh, all the way up to where today you've got, you know, an entire marketing plan, uh, et, et cetera, and you're no longer using, you know, a business plan for dummies. So, and that's great. Some people probably want to connect with you further, find out more about what you guys are up to, though. What's going to be the best way for them to to make that happen? Sure. I mean, you can check out our website, uh, www.conversocial.com. Um, you can also find me online pretty easily. I'm just at Joshua March on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I write blog posts occasionally on LinkedIn about various business things, and I, I tweet about uh, you know everything from the future of technology and, and customer service to, to politics and business stuff. So um, Twitter is probably the easiest place if you want to reach out and engage. There's absolutely nothing to talk about in the politics space right now. So I don't even know what you could possibly have to say. <laughs> yeah, especially right now, right? There's nothing, especially, nothing, nothing at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. So uh, with that being said, though, I, I have a final question for you because, see, uh, I know that there's someone listening and they're they're having that 19 year old moment like you did. You know, they see a hole in, in some way. They see something that they might be able to do. There's someone listening. Let's pretend for a moment that they're even standing in front of the superhero outfit store, Joshua. They want to go and put on that entrepreneur suit for the first time. They're trying to figure out what color their cape's going to be. Do they need a mask? All this types of stuff. And yet in the back of their head, they have the voice. And and I know you know that voice. It's something you've done battle with a lot. Uh, what, that voice that comes up anytime we want to stand in, in our power or go for something great. And, and it says, who are you to try such and such? And, and, and why do you think you'd be able to do it? And do you really think that's going to... It says all of these things that occasionally are not supportive of the idea that we've had. And for some people, they're even related to the voice. So... My question to you is as follows. If you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that they that the person listening would actually do the action steps you suggested in the next 24 to 48 hours, what would you suggest they do? This is a, you know, an interesting question, right? I, I think that the most important thing is really just about mindset, right? And, and for me... You know, it's just about remembering, sometimes having to remind myself every day that, yeah, none of this really matters. Um, we're insignificant little flies on like a tiny little planet, you know, going around the sun that's going to blow up at some point in this kind of massive universe. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I, I, who are you to put, to put on such self-importance that you think you can or you can't do anything, right? We're, we're all insignificant. Um, and, you know, who knows what, what life is going to bring? Who knows what's going what's gonna to happen tomorrow or, or, or today? Um, you know, it's just pretty exciting that we're all here alive. And, uh, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that just like so much is out of our control. Um, you know, almost especially in business, uh, you know, you're really just rolling the dice in so many ways. And, you know, you, you can, you can you know, learn and maybe over a lifetime get slightly better at rolling the dice, um, but you're still rolling the dice. 
And you know, when you go on do any kind of new venture, you know, ninety percent of whether it's going to be successful or not, in many ways, is just out of your hands. Um, and, and I think the most important thing is just kind of you know, rolling that dice and putting yourself into it. Um, and you can never be fully prepared. Uh, you can never have the answer of whether something is going to work or it's not going to work. Um, but yeah, there's one, uh, you know, 100% guaranteed way that it won't work. And that's if you don't do it. Right. And so you just got to You just got to go for it. That, that's it. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing really else to say. Uh, and you know, learn as much as you can along the way, but there's nothing, there's nothing specific that you've got to learn. Um, you've just got to, you've just got to go for it. And you know, life's way too short to kind of worry, sit worrying or stressing about it. Indeed, it is. Definitely appreciate you taking the time to in- invest your wisdom, your knowledge, your experience um, with us here today. Because I know that there's a number of people who have taken a lot of notes, they've listened, they probably even pulled over and said, ooh, that was good. And it came because you were out there doing it and are willing to share it. So thank you for being here today with us at the Cashflow Diary. My pleasure. Happy to. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? Well, definitely track him down. Why not go look at some of his posts on LinkedIn? Why not check out Converse Social? It may not be a, a, a product or a service you're ready, your business is ready for yet, but it could eventually become, or it maybe it is. You're like, hey, I would love to do customer service with no hold. I like that idea, by the way. And it, it, it could be that time for your business to do those very same things too. Hey, we just heard it and you already know it. None of this really matters anyway. So just go do something. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs>